a science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They, I it felt, felt, felt right. Right. I was so And I just thought, well, I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. I am your host, Erin Barker, and this week we're presenting stories about being at peace with yourself and your circumstances and the ways that science helps or sometimes doesn't help uh, people get to that place of peace. So as I was preparing for this episode, I googled peace and science. It's just an example of the kind of serious, in-depth research that I do every week to bring you this very polished podcast introduction. But I came across this article in Science by Katie Langan about the mental health of PhD students and the fact that they suffer from anxiety and depression at, and I quote, rates that far exceed the general population. So my guess is that if you have listened to very many episodes of our podcast, this does not come as a surprise to you. It's definitely not surprising to me. But Katie writes about research that has been done about the effects of what they call mindfulness interventions. If that sounds like made up words to you, like it did to me, she explains mindfulness is about staying present in the moment. And that's the point of these interventions, to retrain your brain so that the frontal lobe, which is the part of the brain that helps you stay calm, has more control. So I'm inviting you all now to let your frontal lobes take over (laughs) and enjoy these two stories that we have for you today. Our first story today is from Trisha Hersey. It was recorded in October 2018 at the Highland Inn and Ballroom in Atlanta. The theme that night was relief. So I landed in Atlanta from Chicago in 2010. My husband's job transferred us and I didn't know a soul. I was a new mom of a three-year-old little boy and I had all these big dreams of continuing my art career and also going to graduate school. I always wanted my master's degree. See, I'm the first person in my entire family to go to college. Both sets of my grandparents barely finishing elementary school as refugees from white terrorism in the Jim Crow segregated south of Mississippi and Louisiana. My parents further instilled this love of education in me, even though they were both high school graduates. My father always wanted to go to college. He wanted to study film. But his dreams were deferred at 19 when he took a job at Union Pacific Railroad so that he could care for his wife and his child on the way. So education for my family was really a tool for liberation. So I always wanted to go to get my master's degree. It was a pull to fulfill my ancestors' dream and also this love of curiosity of learning that I had. So it stayed on my yearly list of goals. It was a huge accomplishment for my entire family when I graduated at 22 with my Bachelor of Science in Public Health. At my graduation, my dad squazed me so tight that I thought that I would crack open. So going to graduate school remained even though money and time and opportunity got in the way. So I was here in Atlanta, so I decided to just apply and look at all the schools here. I did research. I thought about writing, education programs, theater. I went to all of the big open houses. I went and I felt okay, but not really excited. So I landed one day on the website of Emory University. I was there specifically to research their creative writing program, but instead I landed on the homepage of the Candler School of Theology. I know, and I couldn't leave. (laughs) I read every tab, clicked every link, looked at every picture, and I just kept falling deeper into this rabbit hole. It was as if there was this divine intervention pulling me to apply for a Master's of Divinity when I really didn't know what theology was. (laughs) See, I'm a poet, performance artist, and community activist, but I was raised in the church my entire life. 
My father was a Pentecostal, Holy Ghost preaching, fire and brimstone, Holy Ghost catching, falling out, pastor and elder, the Church of God in Christ. I remember watching people in my father's congregation fall out and catch the Holy Ghost and truly embody worship as a way to liberation. And my mother went to labor with me in Sunday school. She stayed for the lesson, then went to the hospital. (laughs) So I know about church, but I went to church because my parents took me. So at 18, when I went away to undergrad, I was done. I never looked back. And here I am, 20 years later, about to apply to one of the top seminaries in the country because it just felt like the right thing to do. I felt like it was some spiritual longing. So I clicked link on the online application and I applied and I waited. And while I waited, I took part-time jobs in retail to kind of make ends meet. I was working at this really fancy high-end chocolate boutique in Buckhead. (laughs) And I was bored out of my mind. (laughs) And I remember being in front of the counter, arranging all the delicate chocolates, and then my cell phone rang, and I ran to it. And on the other end was a voice I had never heard. Hi, this is Mary Boyce, and I'm the admission director of the Candler School of Theology, and I held the phone tighter. And the admissions committee has been sitting with your application for a week, and we are so moved by your work as an artist. And we really want to make space for an artist like you to study here. You are accepted. And my knees felt weak and the tears began to silently flow. And I felt like I wanted to dance, so I danced. (laughs) And all I could muster up in that moment was, thank you. I was finally going to graduate school, and I felt like I was floating on air. And I continued floating through the weeks. I floated myself all the way to the Candler's new student orientation. And I was so hyped and I was so ready. And then I floated into the first week of classes and then the pace felt so rigorous. And the writing style was foreign to me. And I felt unseen. And I felt unheard and inadequate. And I felt unseen in this sea of white classmates who would stay very silent whenever we began to talk about slavery and racism in the church. And I would listen to lectures and I wondered why we were centering European history when I knew that the ancient foundation of Christianity was in North Africa. And one day I got the nerve to raise my hand in my history of Christian thought class And I wanted to ask the teacher why we were using inaccurate maps of Egypt. And he didn't even look up. He said, I don't know, I didn't write the book, next question. And my heart sank. And I felt humiliated in a sea of 200 people in a lecture hall. And then there were the outside forces weighing on me daily also. Eric Garner was just murdered by the police. The Black Lives Matter movement was heating up and there was a constant loop of police brutality on videos and online and everywhere I looked and I was scared. And two of my really close family members died suddenly and I continued to feel feel unseen and this floating turned into a serious crash as I found myself sitting on the stairs of the science building, sobbing to my husband in the phone, What have I done? I can't do this. I hate school. And months later, I was walking home from school in the parking lot with my son. We were walking through the parking lot of a gas station near my house around 4 p.m., and I felt a tug on my shoulder. And I looked, and I saw a young man running with my book bag with the strength of an Olympic track star. And in my bag was three expensive textbooks on liberation theology, my jump drive that contained every single lecture note from every single class, 12 classes, all my research projects, over 100 documents. 
and also a journal with my handwritten sermon, my first sermon ever that I was scheduled to preach in two days. And in this shock, I dropped my son's hand and ran after the thief. I had no way of really catching him. And I was screaming, hey, someone help me, that's my bag. And my son looked up at me and he said, mommy, mommy, that was a bad man. Why would someone do that? And I cried all night. And I was numb and disgusted. And I wanted to quit school that day. And in this moment of clarity, I decided to pray to get some peace. And after I prayed, I just kept repeating, Trisha, do not stop school. Keep going. Keep going. And so I kept going. And that's actually all I really did. I physically just kept going. I totally had mentally checked out. <laughs> I did nothing in class. I literally would get to school, get to class, get the attendance credit, and then go take a nap. <laughs> oh, and it felt so good. It felt so good to rest and nap, and I napped all over that campus. <laughs> I napped under a tree in the quad. And I napped in this atrium. They had this comfy little chair. It was perfect. I also napped in the new psychology building. They had couches set up. I napped on the dance floor after a ballet class. I napped in the library, upstairs in the library. I napped downstairs in the library, in the archives of the library. And my favorite place to nap was in Cannon Chapel. I knew the worship schedule, so I would go on the off days when no one was there, and I would climb all the way up to the balcony. It was my favorite place to nap, right up top. They had these long pews that were actually upholstered, so I could stretch my long body out, and I can go deep into a sleep. <laughs> I could get it in. I went down. And it just felt so healing. It just felt like the right thing to do. So I would set my alarm on my phone for 30 minutes, and I would stretch, and I would go deep into this healing portal. And one day, while I was just getting right into that moment, I hear the loud noise of this beautiful pipe organ playing. And as soon as the first chord played, I jumped up and screamed. <laughs> there was someone there, a musician, who was actually rehearsing for a recital. He didn't know I was there. I didn't know he was there. So I was so embarrassed. And I picked up my book bag, and I scurried away. And during, during this season of napping, I was enrolled in a class called Cultural Trauma. And in it, we learned about all these groups all over the world who were experiencing trauma and how they could ultimately heal from it. And I had the pleasure of doing a research project on Jim Crow survivors. And I interviewed them. And many talked about how trauma was held in their bodies. And this led me on to research articles about how sleep deprivation actually affects our bodies. And I found this beautiful article about how when we sleep, our bodies and mind actually help us heal. And I just was obsessed. And I just kept researching. And I kept napping. <laughs> and I read this beautiful article that said when we sleep, our brain is actually bathed in a chemical that helps us to forget trauma. And I was empowered to sleep more. I was now sleeping from an empowered state. <laughs> and I just kept resting and sleeping, and then I kept getting better grades, and I started to be inspired, and I actually started to make connections between faith and spirituality and the science of sleep, and I just kept going deeper, and I wanted to spread this good news. I was actually watching myself being transformed by resting, being transformed by naps. So I just kept thinking, I'm an artist, I'm a community activist, what could I brainstorm on to help others rest via, via sleep? And so I started a community organization called the Nap Ministry. And we examined the liberating power of naps. <laughs> and we install and curate safe spaces for the community to nap together all over Atlanta and all over Chicago. And we rest together and we nap. And I've been to these events and I've watched people wake up from a nap with tears in their eyes and they've like, I never sleep. I never rest. That was the best nap I've ever had. And I kept sleeping, of course. <laughs> I kept napping. And I was inspired. 
and naps saved me. Thank you. That was Trisha Hersey. Trisha is a Chicago native living in Atlanta with over 20 years of experience working with communities as a teaching artist, poet, performance artist, and community activist. Trisha has research interests that include Black liberation theology, womanism, and somatics, and her work has been seen with Chicago Public Schools, Chicago Park District, Columbia College Chicago, and many more. After earning a Bachelor of Science in Public Health from Eastern Illinois University, Trisha earned a Master of Divinity from the Candler School of Theology at Emory. Her current project, as you just heard, is the Nat Ministry, a community installation that examines the liberating power of rest by curating safe spaces for community to nap together. Our next story today is from Sarah Hurd. It was recorded in October 2018 at Real Artways in Hartford, Connecticut. The show was presented in partnership with the University of Connecticut's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Public Discourse Project. The theme that night was intellectual humility. In June of 2013, I was driving across the desert southwest with my husband. It was a miserable car ride. It was 115 degrees outside the car. It was probably 95 degrees inside the car. And the whole car smelled like hot dog breath because our black dog was in the black back seat of our black car, overheating and stressed out and very not subtly hating us for doing this to her. But I couldn't have been happier. We were moving from Louisiana to California because both my husband and I had just earned PhDs at Louisiana State University, and we had both landed great jobs, postdocs, in two great labs at the same great university, University of California, Davis. The cherry on the top of my perfect life was that I was five months pregnant with our first child, a big, healthy baby boy we nicknamed Bubba. When we got to California, I needed a new doctor, And this new doctor ordered an ultrasound just to have on file some pictures and measurements. A few days after the ultrasound, our doctor called. And the first thing she said was, I'm so sorry. She then told us that the baby was big. We knew that. But that his head was too big. And his kidneys were way too big. And that these two symptoms were consistent with a lot of terrible genetic disorders that ranged in severity from mild cognitive delay to severe mental and physical disability to death within the first year of life to stillbirth. I was taking notes. I understood the words she was saying, like chromosomal deletion. I'm a biologist. I knew what those words meant, but I was very confused because our son was healthy. I said, does he have one of these syndromes? And she said, yes, we think he does. So there was a we. Over the next three months, I had 24 doctor's appointments. They checked his heart. They checked that his kidneys and bladder were functioning. They monitored his size and looked for physical deformities. We saw a genetics counselor who ordered some tests for my husband. And this appointment was most memorable because on our way out the door, she says to us, if you want to do something, it's too late for California. You have to go to New Mexico casually telling us to cross state lines if we want to abort Bubba. They checked his brain with a fetal MRI. And when that came back positive, all these tests were coming back, no new, no new symptoms, no new deformities, no new problems. In the sanity of our own home, my husband and I began to whisper to each other, what if it's just a big head and a kidney problem? What if, what if it's that? So at the next specialist appointment that we went to, we asked the doctor, is that possible? Is it possible he'll just have a big head and and a kidney problem? And her exact words were, we are very confident that this is a true finding. I was crushed. I'm a scientist. I know what those words mean. Confident, very confident, true finding. That meant that they had irrefutable data. It meant that they had robust conclusions based on evidence, and it meant that any other doctor who looked at our file would draw the exact same conclusions. It also, to me, wasn't just a woman giving me her opinion. It was a scientist backed by a team of scientists. So it might as well 
have been science itself telling me that statistically we had no hope. During this time, I emotionally shut down. We had just moved. We didn't know anybody. I didn't have any friends. We didn't have any family in the area. I had my husband, thankfully, who was going through all of this by my side and for himself. And he dealt with it by working a few extra hours and reading medical literature. He's also a biologist, so he was reading about kidney problems and head sizes, and he was able to convince himself that we did have hope, that the doctors could be wrong. But I was having none of that. I read one time on a website for families with children with disabilities that sometimes you have to grieve the child you thought you were going to get in order to accept the one that you did get. So I spent my time just holed up in this emotional bunker doing just that. I killed and grieved the healthy baby and the life I thought we were going to get to make room for our real son. So this meant violently rejecting any happy thought that popped into my stupid head. The image of teaching him to drive or high school graduation, learning to read, would he look more like me or my husband? Even changing a diaper, I stopped as soon as I realized I was thinking about it. But because we didn't have a diagnosis, I didn't know what to make room for. So I sat in my bunker and just visualized as vividly as I could all the potential futures before us. What did mild cognitive delay look like? Maybe a tutor? Maybe he lives at home his whole life. What if it was physical disability? What if he couldn't walk or talk? What if he couldn't swallow or feed himself or use the bathroom? Would he be in pain? Would he be developed enough to know that other kids were making fun of him? I weighed the pros and cons of stillbirth, and I wondered what would happen to my marriage. I didn't have a baby shower of any form because I couldn't pretend to be happy about anything. I didn't buy a single piece of baby clothes because I wasn't sure I would have someone to put in them. And I stopped talking to him. It had been that when I felt him move the first time in the morning, I would say, good morning, Bubba. If he whacked me real good in the bladder, I'd say, oh, you're getting so strong, Bubba. But for a while, he would kick me, and I wouldn't say hello back. My due date approached. They said he was probably 10 or 10 and a half pounds, and they were pretty sure that his head was too big to come out of me, so we scheduled a C-section. I never felt a contraction. We just showed up to the hospital at the appointed time. C-sections are not fun. Um, I was awake from about the sternum up, thanks to a large needle in my spine. The room was very cold, and it was full of people I didn't know. It was a teaching hospital, so there were a bunch of people in the room, all wearing pale green scrubs, the seafoam colored ones. Getting After everything was prepped, in came the main surgeon, and she was wearing all the colors. These were like strobe light confetti bomb scrubs and she picked a Beatles album to play during the surgery and she said to someone if she's hiding a 10 pounder in there I'll be shocked c-sections are blessedly quick um, before long they were telling me to experience I was going to experience some tugging and pressure which was grossly accurate um, I was being jostled around to a really surprising degree and I see the surgeon put her weight down on my belly in a CPR like maneuver and then they say he's out and there was silence for somewhere between half a second and a million years and then he cried my first thought was how fucked up does he look? They wrapped him up, 
and they brought him over to me and put him real close to my face. I wasn't wearing my glasses, so he was right there, and he was purple, and he was scrunched up, and he was weird looking, and he was screaming and covered in crud. And my next thought was, get him away from me and get him to a doctor, which is what they did. I didn't say that out loud. My husband went with him. And I'm lying there on the table by myself, violently shivering at this point, and I'm wondering how long it'll be before we have a diagnosis, how long before we know for sure who our real son is. And then the surgeon has a question for me, and I it briefly flashes in my head that maybe she can tell something from the placenta or something, my guts somehow. And she says, hey, have you been constipated lately? I've got your colon over here, and it looks like you might have been having a problem. I, I don't know what I said to her about that. Maybe, I, maybe thank you. I don't know. Uh, my son Cormac was nine and a half pounds when he was born, and his head was in the 99.99 nine, I don't know how many nines percentile for size. He didn't have to go to the intensive care unit right away or anything, so the first time he saw a pediatrician was in our shared hospital room about 12 hours after he was born. And this woman comes in with a crew of residents or whatever they're called, um, and we tell her our story. We tell her our concerns as quickly as we can and say, please examine him. And this woman saw the bunker. She was warm and kind to us. And she says, okay, let's take a look. And she examines our son. And after a few minutes, she wraps him back up and she says, I think you got one of the good ones. We'll see you tomorrow. Obviously, I don't believe her because that can't be possible. She comes back the next day and she says she read our file. She measures my head and she measures my husband's head and she offers to be our pediatrician when we get out of the hospital, which we accept. And then she says, okay, let's take a look. She examines him and she says, he looks great. We'll see you next week. And about 60 hours after we left our house to go to the hospital, we return with a possibly healthy baby I didn't know what to do. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. We were supposed to be visiting him in a hospital incubator or something. What the hell do you do with a baby? So we go to the doctor the next week thinking surely this is the time that they will find the symptom that is indicative of the disease they were sure he had. And she says, he looks good, we'll see you next week. And then it's, he looks good, we'll see you in two weeks. And then it's two more weeks, and then it's four weeks, and then it's eight weeks, and then it's three months, and then it's another three months, and then it's six months, and then it's, we'll see you next year. And now he turns five at the end of this month, and he just started kindergarten. And he's a tall kid. He's a heavy kid. He has a big but mostly proportional head. (laughs) He's hit all his developmental milestones, his kidneys are fine. He's happy and outgoing, and he is bright in every sense of the word. He loves making people smile, and he really wants to be funny. But he's not funny. (laughs) Because he's four, and he writes his own material, and uh, every punchline has the word poop in it. So what happened? I don't know. I don't know if the big head I notice basically every day is because there's a critical error in my son's genome that makes him at a higher risk for pediatric cancer. Or if the big head I see every day is because his dad is 6'4 and also has a big head. It is unresolved and part of the reason it's unresolved is because I never got to hear from those specialists what 
they thought happened. I never saw them again because they were pregnancy doctors. I never got to say, here he is. What do you think now? I wonder if they even know that he seems healthy. I wonder if they ever followed up or thought about him. I wonder if they ever thought about me because I have certainly thought of them many, many times in the past five years. I will remember some of their words forever. And I wonder if they know about bunkers. My bunker is still inside me and part of me is still inside the bunker. And I know this is true because every time, literally every time in the past five years when I start to complain or feel sorry for myself, for any of the many daily unpleasantries that come with parenting, anytime I start to complain about dealing with bodily fluids or rearranging my schedule again or being woken up at just the right spot in the sleep cycle where it hurts to open your eyes and I go, oh my God, this is the worst. A voice in the back of my head clears her throat. And she says, what the fuck did you just say? And I go, oh, I don't know how I forgot, but I forgot and I'm sorry. This is not the worst. This is not the worst. Driving across Arizona, I knew my son was healthy. Living in California, I knew I was going to watch him die. And now I see him every day and I don't know anything. Thank you. That was Sarah Hurd. Sarah is an assistant professor in molecular and cell biology at the University of Connecticut. Her primary research interest is in how the microbiome has interacted with avian evolution. She is also interested in how we can diversify and democratize the STEM fields in academia. She holds a master's degree from the University of Idaho and a PhD from Louisiana State University. She was a Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Davis. Story Collider is grateful for the support of the Tiffany & Co. Foundation and of Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. Story Collider is led by me, Artistic Director Aaron Barker, as well as Executive Director Liz Neely, with help from Deputy Director Nissa Greenberg, Operations Support Manager Lindsay Cooper, and the rest of our amazing team. The stories featured in today's podcast were from shows produced by Kelly Vinyl, Mesa Salida, Zach Stovall, and me, Aaron Barker. The podcast is produced by Senior Podcast Editor Zoe Saunders, with help from Gwen Hogan. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Highland Inn and Ballroom and Real Artways for hosting these shows, and to Google for helping me prepare my intros. Thanks for listening.